The adjective I would use to describe black holes is extreme. Wonder. Amazing. It's global. Astonishing. It's black. Awe-inspiring, exciting, and unbelievable. Awesome. <laughs> Fun. Terrifying. Energetic. Incredible. Exciting. Mysterious. Massive. <laughs> it's a remarkable. Unknown. Wow. <laughs> The best thing of the Event Horizon Telescope is the global collaboration. Great scientists doing great science. Different people with different perspectives and different ideas. All these people work together as a whole. It feels a lot like a startup. It's good to see the idea works. The most interesting thing we can look for. The universe. It's pushing boundaries. The Earth is our telescope. Doing something that's never been done before is just really cool. We have potentially the chance to rewrite the laws of physics. Yeah, we make it. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the beginning. Bonsoir, good evening. Um, I'm, my name is Ben Wandert. I'm the director of the Lagrange Institute and a member of the Institute for Astrophysics here. And it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce tonight uh, our, our speaker, uh, who is uh, Heino Falke. Um, let me just uh, tell you, after this introductory video, um, showing, talking about uh, the wonder and uh, the awe and the, maybe the, uh, the fear of black holes, um, let me just uh, tell you a few words about uh, the person who will um, lift the mystery uh, in a minute. Um, Heino Falke is professor at the uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen, um, Netherlands. Um, professor of Theoretical Astrophysics and Experimental Radio Astronomy. Um, and he has, in fact, uh, received the Spinoza Award in 2011, which is the highest scientific award uh, of the Netherlands. And he has been knighted, uh, made a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science, and knighted uh, to the Order of the Netherlands Lions. So uh, I asked him earlier tonight if I should call him Sir Heino, but apparently uh, um, we can still go by his first name. Um, he is uh, one of the founders and uh, really one of the originators of the idea uh, of imaging a black hole, imaging um, the event horizon of a black hole. He will tell us what that means um, and the shadow of a black hole and has uh, received significant funding to do this from the European uh, Research Council one of the largest grants that has ever been uh, given out uh, by the Re European uh, Research Council. And uh, tonight he will tell us how uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration made the first image of a black hole. I know. My sincere apologies, am I better understandable now? that I will talk in English. I had half a year of French in school. I, I still regret it that I didn't take longer. So uh, such a beautiful city, such a beautiful language, and I have to talk in English. What a shame. But you know, I hope uh, I will be understandable nonetheless. Um, yeah, what you've seen before was the movie made at the collaboration meeting we had last year showing some of the members of our collaboration, uh, many of the younger ones, that have been deeply involved in, in making this uh, result happen and uh, that you probably have heard about last, uh, uh, this April. Now, this is about black holes, of course, and I think everybody has heard about black holes before. Uh, how does a black hole actually come to life, or actually dies, you know, the question how you, you want to define it. Um, the, the first, or the, the standard way, is to make small black holes is by having a star explode. Uh, and then compress the innermost regions to a very small area, a lot of matter in a small area. And then that means that actually the gravitational attraction will grow, uh, will be bigger. And so that will make that inner part collapse. It will become smaller and smaller. And you would expect at some point there's gonna be a pressure that stops that collapse, right? So if a house collapses, it will be stopped by the Earth. Um, but if you know, the mass is very large, the star is very large, that collapse will actually continue almost forever because there's not a single force in nature that we know that can stop that collapse. So like this house will collapse forever, so to speak, into the center of the Earth. 
Um, and uh, sort of a point will form where all the matter is concentrated uh, in one single, single point. Um, and uh, I'll come to this, what that means uh, in a second. And it can also grow big black holes if you're in the center of a galaxy, in the center of our Milky Way. You have lots of stars flying around. Some of them will collapse into uh, black holes. And then they actually merge together and they form bigger black holes. And you can make grow typically one huge giant black hole in the center of a galaxy. So what, why do we call them black holes? Well, this has to do with a very fundamental property of the universe that Einstein was uh, talking about, that was using. Namely the fact that there's exactly one constant in, in physics, um, one thing that is not relative, that's absolute, and that is the speed of light. Light is sort of the basic standard um, rod stick, the measure tape that we have, which always moves with the same speed, always with the speed of light. Light is sort of the most fundamental element, so to speak, of the universe. And it was then Einstein who actually changed our view of space and time uh, by recognizing that A, you know, light is constant and everything else actually can change and is relative. Uh, he was actually re-describing uh, our understanding of gravity by re-describing, reformulating how we see space and time. He was describing gravity, this force that lets a star collapse, not as a force, but as a property of space itself. That actually space is deformed, that matter and energy can deform space. Uh, it's difficult to imagine in three dimensions, that's why we always plot this in two dimensions uh, as sort of this, uh, this little funnel here that's created by you know, matter and sort of changes and stretches space. Now if you have light go through this curved space uh, and it, it counters and comes close to a, you know, a mass, and that could be any mass, so including that could be you as well, right? So you, each of you will also curve space a little bit, but only a tiny, tiny little bit. Some of us, you know, will curve it a bit more than others, but uh, it'll be a very, very tiny effect. Um, in fact, some of us try to always curve it less, but it's always a struggle, as you know. Um, and, um, you know, if your light then has to follow, go through this curved space, it actually will have to go on a curve because you know, there's no straight line anymore. But there's something else. It also has to take, go through more space in a way, right? So, because, you know, there's sort of, you know, going through this curved space, there's sort of more space to go through. Uh, but it still has to go with the same speed. So, speed is sort of distance traveled per time. The distance is sort of seems to be longer. If you want to have the same speed, you also have to take longer time. And so what it means is that seen from a distance, it looks like that actually time in a curved space time goes actually slower than it goes uh, further away. And that is a very weird prediction. Uh, but it showed that there is this, a, a connection between the property of space the property of the theory of uh, gravity and time, that time would change. Um, now you would think, and actually people thought, this is you know, very academic, right? So how can time actually change and, and, and run differently? Because what it means is, if you have a twin brother and your twin brother or twin sister goes near a, a, a mass, uh, stays there for a little while, comes back, his time went slower, or her time, comes back, you rejoin, uh, you are a, an old lady or an old man and your brother or sister is still a young, uh, young girl or a boy. Uh, that sounds totally counterintuitive and almost impossible. Yet, we actually measure this on Earth and most of you use this almost every day. Every time you use your smartphone, uh, you have your, use your GPS and navigation system, um, you actually measure arrival time of radio signals, of light. Radio signals is also light, uh, just at a different frequency. 
Um, and you make use of the fact that there are very precise clocks up there in space, um, and you measure the arrival time, you know, given by those clocks, you know, by the time given there. And uh, it turns out that these clocks go a bit faster by 38 microseconds or so per day than here on Earth. The same clock here on Earth is slower than up there. And when the people designed the GPS system, physicists told them, watch out, time goes faster up there. You have to correct for this effect. Engineers said, well, crazy, right? We, we, know, we don't believe you. Well, okay, maybe we believe you, but uh, we, uh, we're, we're not gonna use it, right? So we'll build it as we think it is, but we're not gonna switch it on. When they started the GPS system, the story goes, it actually was off. In fact, you can calculate it will be off by 10 kilometers after one day if you don't correct for this effect. And by switching that correction on, by taking the, 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 the time correction from Einstein into account, GPS now works. And so you, know, you are part of general relativity. You profit from general relativity. I mean, you, know, you would not have arrived here you know, if you had been off by 10 or 20 kilometers if you don't know where it is, right? So, uh, uh, so it's, it's very fundamental. Now, what, what happens in the black hole is that the curvature becomes more and more. And the stronger the gravitational attraction, the stronger the curvature is, um, the stronger, actually, the faster you have to rotate around that black hole mass uh, if, you're, if you're close to it uh, in order to not fall in. As you all know, the planets go around the sun because there's the, 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 the equivalence between the gravitational attraction, and I was talking about gravity in terms of a force, sometimes that's easier to do, uh, and the centrifugal force, right? You have to go fast enough in order to not fall in, okay? Now, if the sun suddenly becomes a black hole, actually nothing will change because the mass will still be the same, so we'll still be in exactly the same speed. But you could go closer and closer because the sun will become smaller and smaller. In fact, the sun could go to a size of like three kilometers only. And then you can go to within three kilometers to the mass of the sun. Then the gravitational attraction will grow. The closer you get, the, the stronger the attraction will be, the faster you have to go. Uh, and once uh, you get within you know, three kilometers or so, you would have to go with the speed of light in order to not fall in. And that's what Einstein has forbidden. Right? Because you know, there is a strict speed limit. I'm not sure how, how serious you, you in France take the speed limits on the highways or somewhere else. Uh, but in physics, this is absolutely, you know, uh, absolutely obeyed by everything in the universe. Everything that measures is you know, nicely following the laws of nature and going with just the speed of light and not fast. In fact, it always goes a bit slower because you don't want to run into a radar trap and be, you know, be fined by going a bit faster than the speed of light. So it's always going slower what matter does. Um, and the point is, once you reach this point where you have to go with more than the speed of light, but you can't, there's no way for you out. You actually go inside. You have no chance to ever escape. And that's true for every matter there is. And once you reach that point, it's also true for light. Because light goes with the speed of light. But if you'd have to go faster than the speed of light, if you're inside, that would not also not be able to escape. And this point, this point of no return is called uh, the event horizon. That's when you're deep enough in this trough, um, the attraction is so large, there's nothing there that could ever escape. No information, no light, no sound, nothing. Um, and in fact, according to the theory of, of, of general relativity, all the information, everything that falls in there will be sort of condensed to two numbers, how heavy it is, and how large, how fast it's rotating. That's everything that remains from you. So you, you know, I, we, I throw you in this, and you know, all your history, everything you've experienced, you know, the color, how you look, will disappear into how heavy you are and how fast you rotate. And I add another one from you. You know, only thing that we'll do is by adding the, the, the mass, it will go up by a factor of two uh, to your two-body black hole, uh, and, and everything else is sort of disappearing into, into this, 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 this uh, yeah, one number. So in that sense, black holes in general relativity are the easiest objects in the universe. They can, be, they can have masses of many, many billions of sun can disappear in a black hole. Everything that's left is how, how, how heavy it is. 
Uh, so that's, that's much, much less complex than, than any cell that you have in your body. It's, it's infinitely more, more complex, any, any cell in your, in your body. Now that's what Einstein says, but then there's a problem with quantum physics. Quantum physics you also use every day in your life. If you use your cell phone, it's actually completely making use of quantum physics. All the, the, uh, the electronics inside, the integrated circuits, you know, making use of quantum physics. But at the horizon of event horizon, um, the two theories that work nicely together in your cell phone actually collide fundamentally at this event horizon. And that's actually shown by, this event by the Hawking radiation that you've probably heard about before. Now, I mean, many of you probably will know this, you know, as, as you know, black holes in great detail, but I'll, I'll try to explain this once more, how Hawking radiation is supposed to actually make it possible that black holes that are supposedly you know, never changing, they only you know, absorb, could also evaporate after all. So the way it works is that in quantum physics, you can do crazy things sometimes. Well, actually not more crazy things than we do in, in real life, but uh, you can actually, you have your vacuum, you have your free space, okay? And then you, know, you have no particles, but you can take a loan. You can take a loan of some energy uh, from, from, from free space, so you take money out of nothing, okay? And you take that energy and create two particles from it. But a, a positive and a negative, a particle and an antiparticle. So a plus and minus. And for a little while that actually is allowed. So you can make actually, you know, two particles out of nothing. You take the loan. But of course, as in real life, uh, you have to pay this back. And that's a certain time when you have to pay this back, you know, within certain limits, uncertainty limits. You have to pay this back. So, so you, take, uh, you take energy, create particles, then they live for a little while, and then you, you bring them together and again, then annihilate, and that will create energy. And so then, you know, taking a loan of energy, now we give energy back, all is fine. Wonderful. Nothing has happened. So within a certain, you know, with a certain limit of un uncertainty, you can do this, right? Um, now this happens all the time. Right? No problem. That's fine. Now you do the same thing in, in the vicinity of a black hole. Okay. Wow, well, you already see the problem. One of the particles actually disappears in the event horizon. It's gone. Okay. Now the other one doesn't have a partner anymore to an annihilate. It's actually free. Right? So it actually, it actually evaporates. It escapes. Um, so um, suddenly, if you're near a black hole, it seems as if the black hole can irradiate. It produces energy. And where does this energy come from? You know, the universe is not forgiving. You have to pay back your loan. Where is the energy coming from? It comes from the mass and energy in the black hole. That's the idea. That the energy is taken out of the gravitational field of the mass, essentially, of the black hole. Um, and uh, so it could radiate, says quantum physics. Okay. But then there's another problem that all these quantum objects also contain information. You know, as I told you, you know, if I throw you in, into the black hole, according to GR, all your information is gone. Quantum physics doesn't like that at all. It wants to preserve information. Um, and it actually is very important. If you look at these two particles, they actually can have properties. For example, like the spin. You know, one rotates left, the other one rotates right. And that needs to be preserved, okay? Um, in fact, when you create them, you never know in quantum physics which one has which spin. In fact, it's not even determined. There could be one left up, the other one left, right, or, the, or this one right, left. It's actually not determined until the moment you measure. So this is how it looks. They're created. You don't know what their spin is. Uh, then one escapes, actually, to infinity. You measure it at only at this moment when you know this, this, this particle is, is, is rotating right you know the other one is rota rotating left. Only at this moment, before that, it's actually not determined. There's some ex several experiments which show that. So now you know this is happening. Fine, this always has to balance. But now this one disappears in the event horizon due to you know, the effect we described before. And it's radiated again. But now, how do you know what is the right spin? It should have it had exactly the other one, but you know, if, if the information isn't stored anywhere, it could be anything. That, that's, that it's sort of evaporating. So suddenly you have two particles with the same, so with, with, with not balancing information. And that, you know, 
drives quantum physicists nuts. Okay, that's not allowed. So some ideas are that if you create a particle, uh, it disappears in the event horizon, that somehow there's a ghost-like particle information is stored at the edge of the event horizon. That actually event horizon itself is full of information of the universe, is a, is a, is a, is a holographic uh, storage of all the information that disappeared in the event horizon. Now, that makes quantum physicists happy, but actually it drives people working in the field of GR nuts, uh, general relativity, because you know, if you fall into a black hole, in fact, there should nothing happen at the event horizon. Um, and you always hear that black holes are big you know, destruction machines, that you're being spaghettified, for example, but this only has to do with the, with the uh, gravitational attraction that's being stronger at your feet than at your head, right? If you go to a small black hole, your feet are attracted much more strongly than your head, and you're stretched into like a few kilometers, and your feet disappear first, and then your head comes second. It's not a very pleasant experience, I suspect, um, and not very healthy either. But if you do the same thing for a big supermassive black hole, and you disappear into this big supermassive black hole, the difference in gravitational attraction is relatively small. You can just go right into, okay? And if I put yourself into a box, and I don't tell you that you're falling into a black hole, you're falling and you, you have the impression you are freely floating, you don't even feel anything. You don't even feel that there's a black hole. You think you are floating through free space because you're falling. You know, remember these, these zero G airplanes, yeah, which, which make these, uh, these, these, these curved trajectories? One, when, once the, the airplane is going down, you think you are freely floating. You don't even feel anything. That's because like gravitational attraction and, and, and falling is, is sort of balancing. And that's a very deeply you know, important principle in, in, in relativity. Only once uh, you hit the ground, you know, you know where you are, right? Um, and the same is in black holes. Once you go through the event horizon, there is no surface. So it, you can go through it until you hit the, the, the singularity, the point in the very center, then you're suddenly being, being crushed into a point source. But you can't tell anyone because you know, your, your, sh your, your shout or your, your cry uh, your, uh, will not leave the event horizon. So whatever nasty things happen to you inside, you never can tell anybody, right? So, uh, so here, this is where those two theories really fundamentally collide. And there is, I think, at this point, not a clear understanding you know, how these things are being uh, combined. So it works here, doesn't work on black holes. But important step is, of course, to show that this event horizon actually exists. Uh, do black holes actually exist? Is that, is that theory or is this reality? Does it happen in our universe or is this just a mathematical uh, concept? Now, black holes were, came out of GR, general relativity, in 1916, sort of the basic properties of black holes were described. Nobody believed uh, that this was, had anything to do with reality. Only in the 70s, people discovered quasars, and the astrophysicists came along and said, hmm, maybe these could be black holes. And, uh, and many people still said, this is you know, crazy. When I did my PhD 25 years ago, it's getting longer in the past every year, um, you know, there were still like 30%, 40% of scientists, astrophysicists in our field who said, you know, do you believe that black holes exist? They said, no. Right? Or who believes that they don't exist? Or we have no proof that they exist. So like 30% said, no, we, I don't believe this. The evidence is still missing. That has changed. Now, how, do, how can we try to see evidence for this event horizon? How can we convince ourselves that these are real? Well, the best thing is to, the problem is black holes don't radiate, right? These are holes, so you cannot see them. But what you could see is the hole that they create when you shine light at, at them. So what the best thing is to, to um, the only way to see a hole is by looking at the edge around it. Right, you know, a black hole on a, on a black uh, background is impossible to see. Uh, but if you shine uh, light at sort of an absorbing hole, then you see the light around it. So how does it look like? And this is what you see here, what happens if you shine light at a black hole. Actually, as I said before, because the curvature, it will actually be deflected. It will be, going, will be deflected here on a curve. Um, actually, for the light, this is the straight path straight path through space because space is curved and that's sort of the shortest way to take. That's what it does. Um, if it goes too close, it will actually disappear inside. This black hole here, I like this representation very much, uh, is also rotating 
So it actually can take the space around it with it. So it's like putting a mixer into a dough, right? So it goes around or into water. You, you create a little, little eddy. Uh, and the same happens, so to speak, with black holes and space. The space will go with it when you get close to it. And then light actually here goes, tries to go on this side, but then has to go back and then disappear here in the black hole. You also see something else, namely the color changes. Uh, the light actually will actually change the color here from purple, blue, green, red. Uh, and it, actually this is not, uh, this is not artists' uh, concept, this is sort of a physical concept. Um, the light has to climb out of this gravitational well, it has to sort of go up the mountain, so to speak, and that, that happens what happens to us. If we run up the mountain, you turn red, right? So this is why? Because you have, it's a lot of energy you have to bring up. Of course, I mean, for us, it's because the blood, you know, starts to pump. For, for electrons, it means, for, for light, it means it loses energy. You know, it loses its own energy. And so red light has less energy than blue light. The other interpretation is that, you know, it, essentially light is being stretched. And so the wavelength becomes longer and longer. So this is what happened to light. It's being bent. And there's a particularly interesting region if you shine light you know, from a laser light here at a black hole, it goes around, it's bent, then actually something is happening. Uh, it, it can be, you know, at a certain distance, light can actually bend such that it will, it will end up on a, on a circle which will circle, circle forever. You know, if, if you shoot it exactly at a black hole, it will go in the circle and then, you know, get closer and closer to the circle, but will never leave it. So it's, a, you know, an eternal uh, merry-go-round that it will be on. And if you would be standing here, you'd look in the forward direction, you would see the back of your, yourself, right? So you go in the forward direction, you would never you re reach yourself. Of course, the problem is you cannot stand there very long, right? So you'll, the, the pleasure will be very short. Um, and, uh, and for light, that's the same. These are four light rays. Two are a little bit closer. They'll actually go around and they end up in the event horizon. And the other ones will actually go to infinity. So that's going to be a sharp boundary between inside and out. So everything, every light in between here and here that you shine at the black hole will disappear in the event horizon. If you're outside, it will actually not disappear. Now, this is something that we sort of calculated in the, uh, actually in the 90s and then published here in 2000, uh, how a black hole would look like if you shine light at it. Now, what we realized at the time was that you know, some black holes, certainly in the center of our Milky Way, would be actually surrounded by a hot, optically thin, so transparent, radiating gas. It would shine light from all directions onto that black hole. Yeah? Um, and, uh, and then the same effect happens. The light that is sort of generated within a certain radius will disappear, and what you see is this dark region, which we call the shadow of a black hole. It's not a dark region, because you'll still see light from from before, for example, right? You see sort of a depression, a dark region, so that's why we see, we call it shadow, because you never see the black hole itself, you only see its shadow, right? You see sort of what, it's, what's, what is missing. And it's not necessarily always as sharp as it's shown here. Uh, but anyway, this shadow actually was predicted, or is predicted to have exactly a, a size which is proportional to the mass. Independent of how fast the black hole rotates, well, change a little bit with the rotation of the black hole, but only by a few percent. If you know how big the mass is, you can predict how big the shadow is and should be visible irrespective from where you look. You can look from, from above the black hole, from the side, uh, you always see that, that shadow. Uh, so that makes a very clear prediction. And it turned out that that shadow for the center, so the black hole in the center of the Milky Way was about the size of a mustard seed as seen from Paris in, in New York. Right? So a millimeter sized object uh, in, in, in New York as seen from Paris. That is in astronomical terms, we, we say like uh, 40 micro arc seconds, uh, is, you know, if, if, if you're astronomically interested. Um, and um, this is something that I'll show you is actually just barely resolvable uh, from Earth, if you have a super duper giant uh, telescope. So for at least one black hole, later turned out there's another black hole, uh, this was a clear prediction how large that shadow should be based on the measurement of the mass in the center of these galaxies. 
Now, of course, uh, you have to look at how black holes look like uh, in more sophisticated simulations. This is what we're doing uh, these days, where we actually put in how, actually make a weather forecast how mass and how gas behaves going around a black hole. This is big supercomputer simulation, calculating the gas, the magnetic fields, and also radiation. Now the color, I have to say, the colors we're using here are all fake, okay? We put them in. We only calculate the intensity, how bright something is, but we turn that into a color. And in the previous picture, the same, right? I, you know, we had chosen a certain color to express sort of heat and intensity. We do the same here. And I think we chose the right color scale because that I think gives the right impression. We could have made it all green or pink or, or whatever, a rainbow, but that would have, I think, given the wrong, wrong impression. And so what we see here is really the gas going around the black hole. It actually moves with almost the speed of light. I mean, it looks like you know, cozy little, you know, nice uh, merry-go-round, but actually this really goes with the speed of light around this giant system. Uh, like in, in the supermassive black hole, this, uh, this, this size here would be the size of our solar system, and that would move uh, on time scales of, uh, well, actually take weeks to go around if with, with uh, the speed of light or days. Um, what you also saw, there was something shooting out in the center. Now it's not visible anymore. This is what we call the jet, a plasma, which is shot out from the very center because there are magnetic fields in this, this plasma. They are wound up like a lasso, and it shoots out along the rotation axis of this, uh, of this, of this black hole. Uh, yeah. Um, and this is something that we do see, maybe if you look at it again, so one last time, it's so nice, right, if, if you're falling into a black hole. And this, is, this is actually a VR simulation, so virtual reality, so can, yeah, now we see it, right? So you see here, this, this is not smoke, this is really very, very hot plasma shooting along magnetic fields uh, out along the rotation axis. Um, and this is something we do see in, um, in reality. This here is M87, ah, wrong, I forgot again to put, in, put another one. This is a big galaxy, um, 55 million light years away. Uh, oops, I was throwing a, okay, that was, that was so shocking, so far away, gosh. Um, 55 million light years away um, with a certain uncertainty. So there's like 10% uncertainty on the distance, uh, you should know. Um, and, um, and if you look at the radio, this galaxy has a billion, uh, no, uh, a thousand billion stars, probably. Uh, but in the very center, there's something going on. And if you look at a radio image, it's made with a LOFAR, uh, uh, LOFAR array, which also was, you know, was done with French uh, participation. Um, then you see that the entire 240,000 light years around that galaxy is filled with a bubble of radio gas. And this galaxy seems, this, this gas seems to sh be shot out out of the very center. You see here, if you zoom in, you see this, this, this jet, which is very highly collimated. It's like a fire um, uh, thrower uh, out of the very center. Uh, and you can zoom further in, you see this goes to scales of, uh, uh, yeah, very small scales, and to very close to where we suspect there is a, a supermassive black hole. Now, in order to image that, you need lots of people and you need the entire world. And you've seen some of them in this, uh, in this, uh, in this movie in the beginning. This year is again the, the group picture of uh, the scientists, oh, sorry, this is German. Um, uh, 200 scientists from 60 institutes, 18 countries, six, 16, six continents, uh, all represented here. Um, you need a telescope that's the size of the world. Uh, and this actually is not a new concept. We've been doing this for 40 years in radio astronomy. You can actually, I mean, it would be, I mean, you know, radio, radio has long wavelengths, yeah? And the, the resolution of a telescope is given by the wavelengths divided by the size of the telescope. So small wavelengths give a high resolution. Large telescopes also give a high resolution. You can see small, small features. Now, radio has the problem it has very large wavelengths. I mean, your, your cell phone here has 20 centimeter waves, you know, that big. Your, your eye makes use of a of, 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 of few hundred nanometer waves, right? So your eye actually has a much better resolution than, or, or better, uh, as comparable resolution to 100 meter dish in, uh, in, in, in radio dish. Um, so if you want to do a radio measurement and you know, we predicted that the radio emission would come from near the event horizon. 
uh, you need a really large, large dish. Again, the size of the Earth. And it's very unpleasant if you have to build a telescope the size of the Earth, because you know, it's good, you know, keep the rain, rain away so it can go dry to your telescope, uh, to, your, to your work every day, but also keeps the sun away. So, and it costs a lot of money. So you know, it's, we, we very quickly realized that's not a good idea. Um, but uh, what you can do is you can combine telescopes all over the world. You're missing a lot of light, but by you know, combining them, making them work together, um, phasing them up, uh, you can actually synthesize a virtual telescope in the computer that is almost as good as a worldwide telescope. It doesn't get all the information, but it get, gets a lot of information. Um, and uh, it also requires these telescopes to, be, to record data and also to be synchronized in time very precisely. So all of them have an atomic clock to you know, be very uh, precisely combined. Uh, these are some of the telescopes that we see. Here's the telescope in Mexico with a crew. In fact, we had mixed crews from all the different institutes at, at these telescopes doing the observations. Uh, this year is in Hawaii, uh, this is in Arizona, this is in Spain by the IRAM telescope, which actually has a headquarter in, in Grenoble. So this actually is a Spanish, French, uh, German institution, uh, yeah, situated right in the middle between uh, Spain and, uh, and Germany, i.e. in France, um, and uh, the, the South Pole telescope. Uh, and I, I was here at the, in, Span, in, in Spain. This is Thomas Grichpan, who did one of the very first pioneering experiments uh, in, in this field. And I was just looking over his shoulder, looking how he was, he was doing things and enjoying the really great food in, in Spain. I was, I was saying this morning, you know, I, I chose for Spain because it had the best, best, best cooks and the best, uh, best food of all the telescopes. Um, now I show you here sort of uh, how it looks. This is sort of, uh, this is the Iram 30 meter telescope in uh, near Granada uh, in the, actually it's a ski resort. This was a Google Earth flight. You go up there with the Iram, uh, with Iram bus. Um, I'll, I'll stop the cheesy music. Uh, you go there with a, 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 a cable car. Uh, you see, you know, it was still, it was, it was April 2017 when we did the observations. There was still a little bit of snow. The last days of, of skiing were still going on. Um, so the next step is you have to go there with a, uh, a red track, um, but just a nice part, right? You don't want to get good food, but you have to, can ride on these things, so that's actually quite nice. Um, so this is a crew of astronomers going up to the mountain. Uh, in the summer you can drive your car, but in, in the winter you have to uh, go with, uh, with that thing. Um, uh, and yeah, this is the view from, from the telescope. So this actually, the ocean is not far away. Granada, you can see. This is a 30 meter telescope. I think it's, it's uh, I don't know how old it is now. It was, I think it was built in the 70s. Pretty beautiful uh, telescope. Uh, these are the, our equipment. Actually, lots of hard, drip, hard drives. Each of these uh, packs here has uh, eight hard drives with a terabyte. This is the control command room. Still a sort of design of the 70s, 80s. Um, this is you know, a telescope moving now. You see some clouds. We don't like clouds because uh, millimeter waves that we are measuring. Yeah, th this actually looks like a, a, a U-boat uh, because it was built by Coop, actually a German company. So this is how the light comes in here, it's reflected, it's chopped off. Actually, you can see on the source, off source sometimes. This is me actually taking a picture um, with my cell phone. This is a receiver. Uh, the receiver, uh, very complicated, important thing. This is one of the first atomic clocks used. It's actually now retired. Um, yeah, you've seen that. This is the food, yeah, I told you. Very nice. For an observatory, it certainly is. Uh, it was actually birthday here for, uh, yeah. So th this is a, it looks all very fun, but of course, you know, you want to have good weather um, uh, because, as I said, the millimeter waves are actually absorbed by, by uh, humidity in the, in the atmosphere. And you have to have good weather all around the world. And so we had to really wait for good weather to, to come. Um, and usually it never works. It never is good weather everywhere. But in this case, we had fantastic weather on the first day everywhere, all around the globe. It was good weather, sun was shining, no clouds whatsoever. And you start observing, this is an online tool, tool that we built that shows sort of the world. And you see sort of the sources moving over, uh, over the Earth. Well, because the Earth is rotating. 
So you see here M87, it's one target, the other one is 33273, one of the first, qua the first quasar ever detected. We're still observing it. Uh, that started the entire field. Um, and you know, we, we're, we're observing with, with all the different telescopes and recording the data over a few hours. Uh, we're using the other, tele other sources as a calibration tool. And we were sort of calibrating our data on, uh, on, uh, on these other, other sources. And then only then we're really operating on our main target source, M87, Messier 87, which I was told was actually the observations of M87 discovery was made here in Paris in a, in a house that's still standing, right, from the roof here in Paris in the 19th century, in the, 18th, in the 19th century, 1800 something, right? So that's what, what Messier was observing. So this is how an observing, and it runs for hours. And for some telescopes, actually, especially if you're here in, in the Americas, they actually have 16 hours shift. And so we had the first day was fantastic, uh, fantastic weather, never as never seen before. Second day was fantastic as never seen before. Third day was fantastic as never seen before. Fourth day, everybody was, 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 was totally crushed and, 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 and tired looking at the sky. Eh, it's a bit, bit, bit cloudy, isn't it? Let's, you know, let's call it a bad day, right? So it's a, normally would have observed, but you know, it was like, we were, you know, the next day we also didn't observe, and then we started, and again it was fantastic weather again. I think we've never had such a beautiful period of good weather everywhere uh, before or after. I mean, it was only one after, but uh, it was more normal. So this is then how, you know, this is how they looked before. Uh, the crew at, in Chile, actually, uh, this is how they looked after the observing run, so it was very tiring, you know, I was going through all the night, uh, and um, yeah. And then, of course, we make images, and I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the main result. I'll explain a little bit how we arrived at this later. Um, but this is sort of the Zoom, uh, which I showed as a press conference we made together with ESO. In fact, with, now I switch the, move the sound again on, because it's sort of music that my uh, son made. He's composing film music for television, and, 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 and mainly for television. So we're now starting here. Zooming into Virgo A and uh, well, MA7, that's the same name, two names for the same thing. completely different from everything we'd ever seen before, but exactly what we had expected. A ring of light and a dark region, a dark shadow, shadow in the very center. Um, this is so beautiful, and I saw this the very first time. It was much more ugly than it was there. I was hovering above the ground for about one hour. And then, uh, you know, but then you realize we have to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. We have now have sort of like three quarter of a year to you know, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, to actually check what we're doing, what we're doing is right, you know, because you don't want to be fooled by your own expectations. So if you find something that really looks exactly how what you expected, then you should be very careful. Um, and I try to uh, explain how how imaging works. Uh, and this here is again the the Earth. This is sort of the image. And um, now, how how do you make these images? Um, it's it's difficult to explain, but mathematically. It's actually related to uh, well the Fourier transform. A Fourier transform is something that you that you do when you transform a sound, like you know you have the uh, a sound a sound wave, you turn that into a frequency. You know, we have something that goes like this, and you say this is one sound, one note. You know this is an, an A, or how, how do you say this in English? Yeah, uh, a key, or how, is it a key? Or yeah, uh, if you if you Pass a certain key on, on, on your keyboard uh, of, of a piano, right? So it, 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 you, you translate something from, from, a, from um, uh, well, you actually translate one number into a wave, right? And you can do the opposite. You could, can t take one, one wave into, into a, a key. Uh, and like music, it's built up of different, different uh, keys, right? Uh, notes, 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 okay, yeah. Um, so low notes and, and high notes. Um, and you can do the same with an image. An image you can compose into frequencies. 
uh, it's a mathematical transformation, right? So then you get the notes of that image. You can have low notes and you can have high notes. Uh, and the low notes actually give you, uh, give you sort of the large scale structure of the image and the high notes a fine scale structure of the image, okay? And the, the, and the separation of telescopes is like a string that measures those, those notes. But the, the, the thing is that long, a long string essentially measures actually the high notes, not, not different from, from, uh, from the piano where the long ones give you the, 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 long, uh, the deep sounds. Here, the, the long strings give you the high notes, okay? You measure them and then you, you take that, those notes and put them together into, a, uh, uh, into an image. So if you have one, one line, you only know, get sort of one structure. But as, as soon as you add more nodes, the image becomes clearer and clearer, and, uh, and suddenly you build up that music piece. Right? It's like, you know, initially just, you know, if you have one note, you bang, 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 you don't know what the sound is. But if the more notes you have, you can recognize the music, so to speak. Uh, this is what you do. Um, but that process requires some, some skills and you're, you're missing some information. You never measure all the notes. You know, you never make a perfect note, uh, a perfect music. Uh, you're always missing some, right, in, in your, and so you have to fill this in with some algorithms. Uh, and the first thing we did was actually, you know, give the data to four ind ind independent groups to privately, you know, the data came out, was calibrated, and then for a week, you know, four groups were not allowed to talk to each other and had to make an in image the best they could independently of each other. And all of them found a ring, uh, which was very exciting. Um, and, uh, and then we ran through a big study, again, started all over again, ran through a big computer-generated study or computer uh, study to actually look at what are the best parameters and so forth. And, uh, and we made images again and, um, with, 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 with scripted, autom automized, and these are four different images made on four different days. And they all look the same again. Uh, and also different methods gave the same results. And so that gave us confidence. And we also tried uh, synthetic data. So we used you know, things which were not looking like a ring and pr pretending we would observe this and look whether our algorithms would give the same results. And if, if there was a ring, it would recover a ring. If there was a two double source, it would give us a double source. So we really went into great detail to check all of this. We also try to simulate this uh, better. Uh, for example, yeah, this is a result of a simulation. We actually did many, many simulations. Again, uh, a big library of many different you know, black holes, large and small, a lot of accretion, a lot of matter falling on, looking from different angles. And what you see is what I just described. You have matter going around. Uh, you see the spiral structure. But you see this ring, which is there. And you see the dark region in the very center. And all our simulations really made the same, gave the same answers. It always looked so, somewhat like this, uh, changing the parameters. And that ring, again, was just a measure how, how massive that black hole is. And we then presented, we had a simulated observation. Uh, this is the observational result. And this is then one of the models, then folded through a simulated observation. Now we, we, we run it through the same data reduction. We, 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 we uh, and then, you know, or something like this at perfect resolution, you get something like that. Yeah. So it could have been much nicer with more and more telescopes uh, all around the world. We could have gotten something uh, and much larger. We could have gotten something like this. But, you know, this is a limit of we are. We can just barely resolve it. Uh, but this, on the other hand, is a, uh, is a sign that we're not doing something completely wrong. You know, the, whatever we simulate in the computer, you know, it, it often looks pretty much like what we observe. So that tells us that the theory of relativity seems to be working very nicely and, and, and well in our, uh, in our observations. Then, of course, a big day came, right? So we had this press conference, and we actually specifically went to Europe in, in, in Brussels. This was a green room before we went into the, the, the press conference. This was before the, the press conference. Um, this is actually where all the Brexit uh, uh, press conferences are, and so the idea was to do something nice now in this room, right? So not always have the bad uh, news there. And we also wanted to express, because this was a strong European collaboration, we had, you know, really a strong collaboration with uh, people from Span Spain, France, uh, Germany, Netherlands, 
in there, and of course, a lot of funding from the European Commission. So the European co uh, Commissioner actually opened this, and uh, he was very surprised in the end because he had never had a, a press conference that was clapping and shouting and cheering, and so that's what happened here at the, at the end. And that surprised me as well, so the, the emotional reaction to this result. I mean, you know, we, we did a dry run before with staffers from the EU, and people were sitting there like, like they hadn't seen it before. They were like, like really, really um, tense, and they said, you know, I was moved when I saw this. And the same reaction I heard afterwards from a lot of people, friends and others said, you know, they were like exhilarated, and, 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 and you know, it, it was a, a, a really a moment that was shared almost around the world. You know, in school, you know, teachers were, you know, having this, the students were actually showing the teachers. Everyone you talked to had seen it somewhere. And it was actually shown at the same time in different places around the world. Um, you know, what I said at some point is, you know, we, we, we used the world to make that image. We gave it to the world and the world embraced it in a way I had not actually expected it. And I think there was an emotional reaction to, because black holes are, I think, a symbol of more than just uh, black holes. It's not just science. They also are a symbol of something, maybe a symbol of fear, the symbol of, of uh, the final frontier, the final end, maybe of death. You know, I called it, it looks like, you know, feels like you're looking at the, the gates to hell, right? So you have your enormous ring of fire and then you disappear into something. You can, could even survive, but you cannot talk about your experience. So I think black holes have also this, this mystical uh, ring to it. But now you can see, now you can see for the first time really what it looks like. So I think that, that's, that, that might have played as well. Plus, of course, now we really have the problem with, with, with quantum physics, right? So I think that's what most people thought. Oh, shoot, you know, we really have a problem now between quantum physics and relativity. I'm pretty sure that's what was in their mind, really. Anyway, it was, on the, it was really on the, the front pages of a lot of uh, newspapers, if you'd seen that. Uh, I think the, the media um, uh, reach that people have character was four and a half billion people were sort of exposed to that image. I think this is really like, uh, you know, this is, think of any marketing campaign you would have to make to reach four and a half billion people. Yeah, it's almost impossible. <laughs> people always ask you, what is the, what's the value of astronomy? You know, I think that that was value in that day. You know, we sort of united, I think, the world a little bit and, 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 and uh, I think this is, the societal value is almost impossible to, uh, to measure. Except, you know, there's one, I think, Asian company who actually tried to copyright that image very quick and try to sell it. And then it was an outcry because this is, of course, in the public domain. Uh, and, and they lost, I think, 20% of their stock value and they had a billion euro value, so to speak. So, you know, they, the, the, that image cost 100 million euro changes in, in sort of in, in, in a day or so. Um, it's quite, quite amazing to think about it. Uh, and of course, the social media was very active. So Sarah Marco, Markov compiled this. Uh, lots of, you know, interesting I don't show everything because we have kids here. So, but you know, um, certainly cats. You know, these are cats and black holes. Also very popular for sure. And yeah, you know, so we don't want to go into details here. So, um, what we are not done yet, of course. We want to do better in the future. So, what what's the next steps we do? And I'll take you actually to the French Alps. We sort of, we will try to actually equip more telescopes. And this is sort of a visit we we did to. Uh, uh, yeah, to the, the, uh, to the Plateau de Bure. There's an interferometer actually in the French Alps that's been operating and actually was involved in the very first measurement, but it was now being upgraded. We'll try to add it to, uh, to the array uh, actually this year, next year. Uh, now you see it here appearing here. This is actually a James Bond mo uh, moment, right? When you fly to the Alps and you suddenly see these things appear. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so 15 meter dishes. Uh, standing there, um, and they measure exactly the wavelength that we have. Um, and they have added actually were six in the beginning, actually started with three, and that six for a long time, now they're expanding to 12. And we combine them all uh, into one telescope. It's actually uh, one of the most sensitive uh, telescope then in the world, next to the Alma array. And so we're now landing here. And this is where they're being built in, the, uh, in this construction hall. Um, and um, again, this is also James Bond-like as you go to this, this, this building. So on the Alps, they're building these telescopes they're, they're on, the, on the mountain. Um, and so that will be added uh, next year. It will actually make the images of M87 much better. There also will be a telescope in Greenland. It will be added. 
So the more telescopes, the better. Um, then, uh, if you want to look at the center of our own Milky Way, we need telescopes in the south. Um, and if you look at the distribution of telescopes around the world, uh, there's not a single telescope in Africa. And that would nicely fit, uh, because the, 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 Milky, the center of Milky Way is actually going right overhead in Africa and in Chile. Yeah, it's sort of from, from France, it's very difficult to see. From Greenland, it's impossible to see. But from Africa, you see it like for a long time. So you want to have a telescope in, in Africa to really round off the array, to have more measurements. And so this is actually one of these IRAM telescopes, exactly the same design. The first one that was ever built actually standing in Chile. And so uh, we want to use parts of those, not all of it, to move it now to Africa and then uh, replenish it with the new parts that are now being built in France for the expansion of the array. So this is still available. Uh, the knowledge and the technology actually upgraded components and then placed it into Namibia on this mountain here. This is the South Africa, this is Namibia, and this is here where this mountain is located. It's called the Gamsberg Mountain. Um, actually a perfectly flat tabletop mountain. It's actually gorgeous if you have ever been there. A, the sky is fantastic in the southern hemisphere because you see, you know, you see the Milky Way going right overhead and at night it's, it's totally dark. You see, it's almost like, like painted. To see the night sky in the southern hemisphere, certainly at this location, is just mind-boggling and amazing. Um, and certainly on this, on this mountain, seeing a sunset or a sunrise, because you see really 360 degrees horizon. It's the second highest mountain, and so you can look everywhere. Uh, and it's, you know, it's high enough. Um, and it was meant for telescopes. Actually, it was bought by the German Max Planck Society for 7,000 marks in the 70s. So it was, they never put telescope there. So we now try to put you know, the, uh, the French design, German, European, Swedish dish on that mountain in Namibia um, with the help of, of, of Iram, of course. Uh, I, I'll show you that, that mountain a little bit just to give you, you know, some movies here. This is you know, three kilometer long. It's totally flat, it's totally amazing. And then you look into the Namib, towards the Namib, which is the driest desert in the uh, in, in, in the world, uh, and one of the oldest one. We also couple this to outreach programs. So in, in fact, we have produced some uh, outreach materials and we actually have an, a mobile planetarium which you can just you know, pump up and you go to, in fact, you know, the villages in, in Africa uh, and they, in Namibia, they're very keen on good education. They're putting a lot of effort into education. And you know, I've been in, in, in Windhoek and you've met really fantastic students, but they don't have an opportunity now to really, you know, head on questions, very sharp people, but they don't have an opportunity to really develop further into science and so forth. So they also want to build up, uh, you know, new generation of scientists, engineers, and academic uh, research and education in Namibia. So we want to combine this, starting from, from the young ones, from the kindergarten age, to actually university, by coupling them to a top research program. So this is something we're, we're trying to do, and we have you know, some support, uh, also including from companies now, which, which, which love that and, and help us to make this happen. Uh, so this is a, the next probe. And then in the, in the next step. And then the final, the final frontier in, in 20, 30 years, maybe 40 years, who knows how long it takes, we try to put dishes into space, have them go around the Earth, um, and then if you place them around Earth at slightly different orbits, they will sort of drift apart. Um, because the inner one will go faster. So initially they will go together, but if you put them you know, at slightly different orbits, the inner one will go a little bit faster, and so they will drift apart, and then you see a configuration where you suddenly have long separations. You start with small ones, and you go to long ones, and they rotate around, and then you can get all actually notes uh, of your music you can actually listen to. You know, the, 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 the deep ones and the high ones in all directions. And so this is something that can allow us to make us even sharper images of black holes. These are simulations of the center of a Milky Way um, at 230 gigahertz, it's blurred, but at 690 gigahertz, higher frequencies, you actually see a sharp region. And so if you average this, this is, it's variable, but if you average this, you see a very nice ring, you see sort of the, the, the fluffy stuff around, you see the shadow here, and that will actually respond to the theory of gravity that you have. So if you have a crazy theory of, gra theory of gravity, and many people do these days, and for good reasons, uh, then we can test it. Uh, and if you do this space mission, you could get almost you know, very, you know, the same quality and sharpness 
uh, as, as we predict here in, in the simulations. So much, much better than what we get with, with a ground-based array. So with a ground, we can always do you know, something. You know, we get sort of this, this fluffy ring. It's already amazing and, and fascinating, but you know, in the long run, we can do even better. And so learn more about space and gravity. So this is just the beginning. And maybe it turns out, I mean, for now, everything we found is consistent with what is predicted by the theory of Albert Einstein. I still hope that this guy goes wrong at some point, but we never know. We'll try our best to you know, falsify him, but may not succeed. Thank you for your attention. Oh, by the way, sometimes people look for, for what actually, what's going to happen in the future. I mean, the far future, I forgot to show. This is Paris. This is a black hole. I thought it was here, but you know, it's actually a DRP, so you know. Anyway, good. So, questions? Thank you very much, I know, for this um, lecture. There's a little bit of time for questions, so I'm sure you're all burning uh, to ask what you've always wanted to know about black holes. Go ahead. Well, it's not really concerning black holes themselves, and it might, it might sound like a stupid question, but when looking through a satellite dish or through a giant telescope at space, at what point, like, do you see, I mean, we all see the sky as blue, right? But space is dark and black. So at what point do you see space as dark and black and do you just stop seeing the sky? Oh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, as always, the stupid questions are the best one. Um, and actually, I made my career by asking stupid questions. I've never had a smart answer, but I always ask a stupid question. So um, the, uh, the reason why the sky is blue is, of course, because there is an atmosphere and the solar, the sun is scattered and uh, the blue light is scattered the most, okay? And so we see a little bit of blue light and atmosphere. But most of the time, if you look at night, we can see the stars because, you know, light goes through the atmosphere. If you do the same at radio waves, for example, the radio waves also go through the atmosphere and you, don't, you, can, you can see the sky. But if you go to a millimeter radio waves, the high frequencies, the sky suddenly becomes dark uh, because it starts to absorb the radio waves. Yeah? Certainly if there's a little bit of, of humidity in the air, suddenly you don't see the clear sky anymore, you see, you know, you see just darkness. If you, do, if you go to x-rays, for example, Röntgen, you cannot see anything from the sky. So depending on which wavelengths you look at, the sky will be, will be dark. Now, you will not see the sky, and uh, uh, the stars. So then you have to go into space to actually avoid the atmosphere and then see. And from space, you can see at all frequencies, uh, almost all frequencies, you can, you can see the stars. Um, at some point, even at some frequencies, our Milky Way actually becomes absorbing, so you can only see our Milky Way. You can only see inside our, but these are only a very few frequencies, ultraviolet and, and very low frequency radio. Too long an answer, but I, I, I keep giving long answers, so I see no. Other questions? Um, in your picture, um, it looks like the, the, the um, rotational axis of the, um, of the black hole was just in front of us. Is, is it uh, true or not? Um, yeah. Um, the. In, in, on this radio source M87, we see this jet coming out. And actually, it goes in both directions, but we only see one side. Um, and, we, and the reason for this is that this, this, this axis, this jet axis, actually is probably within 20 degrees of our light or sight. So it actually, you know, it, it's not shooting at you, but it's shooting right next to you. But this side of the jet will be brighter. This is what we know. Um, so we know that this, the ring, the rotating gas, you know, will be shooting somewhere in this direction relative to you. We don't know what the axis of the black hole is. It could be different. We cannot measure this yet. So we know from, from how the gas is rotating, but the black hole could actually be pointing in any direction in terms of how it's rotating. And so we're making some assumption when we simulate this, but we, we don't know for sure. And so actually we have simulated all directions. You know, we have added simulate in all directions. 
And about the future of the life of a black hole? Yeah. Do we know anything? <laughs> well, uh, for all practical purposes, it will keep growing, right? So the idea of this Hawking radiation, um, even if that is true, which is still a theory, right? So it's, it, it hasn't been experimentally verified. It's almost impossible to, impossible to experiment, directly experimentally verify. It will take, I don't know, an enormous amount of time, many, many, many orders of magnitude more than the current age of the universe for black holes to, to evaporate. And so, in, in, for all practical purposes, for the next hundreds of billions of years, black holes will keep growing. And nothing will happen to them. Sometimes they can merge. You know, black holes can merge, and then they become even bigger. Um, and more and more matter will go in there. It doesn't mean all the matter in the universe will disappear in black holes. It may be that they're just you know, floating away, and if they never hit a black hole, they will not disappear. Yeah, so I think the likelihood that you or, or me ends up in a black hole is pretty small. Well, at how many kilometers do you start to get sucked in? You start to get what? Sucked in. Um, yeah. Ah, very, ah, yeah. How many? If you ask me in kilometers, oh, you got me now. I don't know how that, how much that is in kilometers. That's too smart a question you ask. Um, so if you turn the sun into a black hole, if you turn the sun into a black hole uh, it's about three kilometer is where the event horizon is. Um, but it's actually at, um, uh, I think, three times more. So it's at, at uh, six. So it's about nine kilometers from the center of the sun, so to speak. Yeah. Um, that's when you were, I mean, before, if you're outside, depends on how you, if, if, if you're outside, you could still sort of orbit on a, you know, go around in circles. But then with spin-off light, you'd be very dizzy, I, I can tell you. Because you would go around the sun within, within a millisecond or so, right? So this is a, a thousand times per second. Yeah, so if, even then you would not uh, be very happy, I think. You would, you know, your stomach wouldn't feel well. Uh, if you go a little closer, then you go in a spiral and end up. Yeah, yeah um, how do you choose the, the frequency to observe? Is yeah, that... very good question. Uh, this, this actually depends on how... Um, well, our models, I mean, this was part of our, actually my PhD thesis, you know, predicting where the, which frequency comes from which, which uh, direction. And it turned out that in the models, were, it was predicting that if you go to higher and higher frequencies, you would get closer and closer to the black hole. And roughly at 230 gigahertz, one, meter wa one millimeter wavelengths, the emission would come from close to the event horizon. But this is specific to Galactic Center and M87, who happen to be uh, where well, this happens to be that frequency. For other black holes, it could be a different frequency. It could be lower or higher. Depends how big the black hole is and how much matter is falling into it. So from each black hole, you have to choose the right frequency. One final question. We were actually lucky that this is possible because had it been higher frequency, we could not have done it from the ground. There's so much luck in the end involved in this result. You can't believe it. Really blessing. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is regarding more of terminology. When we look at this image, would we say this is the image of a black hole, of the event horizon, or the shadow of a black hole? Ha, very good question. We had intense discussions. I, I personally think we still need to really sharpen our understanding, our terminology on this. Some of that is actually philosophy, right? What are you seeing there? What are we really seeing? I mean, if you follow the light rate, you're really looking into the event horizon. So your line of sight ends up in the event horizon. So you could say, I'm seeing, the darkness I see is I'm looking into the event horizon, okay? But that is to some degree model dependent. If, if Einstein is not right and you have something which is, you know, crazy theory of gravity, you could make something that looks almost like, uh, like a black hole, but it's not a black hole. It absorbs the light slightly outside. There's no, no physics that we can imagine that could do this, but in principle, you could imagine this. Um, then you, that would look almost the same. So you're never sure what you're looking at. That, that's why I like to say, you're looking at the shadow. You can't see the black hole, but you only see its shadow. It's, it's not revealing all its properties, all its, 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 its mysteries. Uh, it's, sort of, it's hiding this behind this, this dark region a little bit. So yeah, but I, I, I'd like to, I mean, many of my, my physics colleagues are very outspoken and say, you cannot see the black hole. 
But I think within the theory of GR, you actually do see the event horizon, um, plus the effects of light bending. Um, but that's a discussion we need to sharpen and understand what does it actually mean to see. You know, if, if you, how, what does it mean to see nothing? You, know, you don't see the light coming from it. You see the light, the not light being there that should have been there. It, does that mean you see something? You know, it's a nice, you know, you can, every kid can try to, to, to philo philosophize about this, and I think we don't come to a clear, clear answer. So I think many questions remain, but uh, for now, let's thank Heino for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.